We're in Isaiah 43. By way of introduction, I just want to say to you that we've completed a study in recent days. It was a study of the book of Acts. And in all my ponderings, trying to figure out where to pick up next, I thought, wow, that's a hard book to follow. But you know, a verse has been just playing on the edges of my mind all week. And that verse all by itself has been a blessing to me because it's a verse we're all very familiar with. It's in the book of 1 Corinthians. The Bible says, Now there abideth these three, faith, hope, and charity, which charity is the word agape, love. So we could say faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is what, class? Love. That's right, it's love. And the reality is, is that in remembering that verse, we all have fond memories of the whole passage because it's the love chapter in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. But it's smack dab in the middle of a discourse on uh, spiritual gifts. The apostles trying to walk the people of God in Corinth off of the cliff, if you will, off of the back from the edge. Because they were so committed to the idea of speaking in tongues and miraculous gifts that he had to say, listen, the great thing is love, loving people. So you kind of see the chapter about love and its own setting, but it's actually in the middle, 12, 13, and 14, which deals with spiritual gifts. And sometimes because of all of that, you're like, wow, I wonder what he means here, and I wonder what he means there. We miss this. Get this for a moment, will you? Faith, hope, and love. Do you know how we begin this journey? By faith, right? The just shall live by faith. And the Bible says, by grace you are saved through faith. Faith is how we start. And when we look at hope, I really honestly do not know what people do who have no hope. They're all going to go through that same door called death at one time or another, right? If they have no hope, that's, that's got to be completely, uh, completely overwhelming when a diagnosis is brought down. They don't know where they're going to spend eternity. And there's absolutely no reason why they ought to be in such a state. But those of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ, we have hope. Amen. It's amazing hope. It goes beyond just going through the door of death. Some of us are going to bypass that altogether. And not only that, but we have a kingdom because we're not only going, we're coming back. And it's really a full-bodied hope. We know where we're going. Now, if that were not true, i got to tell you, if I didn't have faith, hope, and love, I really don't know if I could sustain the trials of this day we live in. This is a difficult day. We had a person who visited our service on Sunday night last week, and they, were, they had like four or five churches or whatever on their list of places to go, and on Sunday night they went from place to place to place, and they found the doors were closed and the lights were out because Sunday night service was done. Interesting. They came in late because they said, we just were looking for a place. And they go around to churches because they're doing some missionary enlistment of uh, support. And they said they, that you would not believe how many churches are now being served by an interim pastor. Why is that? It's because it's hard out there for a pastor. A day of apostasy. And it's not something that that should overwhelm us because we have hope, but sadly some churches do not amplify the hope. The Bible says he who has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. So hope is supposed to be a cleansing agent in our lives. Knowing we're going to stand in the deep carpet as God's children, we're going to get ready, you know. We want to get our garments all spotless and clean as best we can, so we're ready. But my point is this, without the hope, I don't think my knees would go without buckling. I just don't. There's all kinds of news. I know stuff on the other side of the nation that I really just don't want to know. But because I have hope, I realize that we are not long for this 
this mess down here. Amen. Title of the message, of course, was Hope for Desperate Times. We're in desperate times. But no, I can't stop. Faith is where we start. Hope is where we're going. Love is what we do. <laughs> That's the here and now. That's the day-to-day. -day. It's hard to be a loving person in an egocentric, egocentric world. A world where we're all about ourselves. And, you know, we can, we can push and shove that on other people. But honestly... Uh, you know, I feel like we ought to get ourselves the support group spirit going on here and say, hi, my name's Dave and I'm a sinner. And you'd say what? Hi, hi Dave. Just say hi, Dave. Say it, will you? Hi, Dave. There you go. Because that's what they do in those Alcoholic Anonymous. You know, it's like you go in there and say, listen, I'm a sinner. Hard for me to love people. Because people are, you know, they're not always dependable. And sometimes they hurt you. And sometimes you hurt them and you embarrass yourself in front of them. It's hard to love. You know, when we come out of the book of Acts, I would suggest to you we saw what love looks like on display. Paul, <laughs> the apostles, the beatings, the imprisonments, and yet the getting back up and going back into the fray. Wow. Love, that's our touchstone today. That's why the greatest of these is love for the Corinthians, especially who were getting caught up in all the extras. He said, listen, you need to love one another. And that's what Paul and the apostles did in the book of Acts. But I want us to go back to our hope this morning. Doesn't that sound like a good place to go? Yeah. I'll tell you what, you come to Isaiah chapter 43 and you're in a book that's been oftentimes referred to as the fifth gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John... <laughs> Isaiah, <laughs> because it talks so much about the Lord Jesus. It is in the book of Isaiah in chapter 53. We get that great passage. It tells us he was wounded for our transgressions and so forth. It is a messianic passage written hundreds of years before Jesus came. And it gives that grist for the mill of our hope and of our faith that, like nothing else. I mean, you look in the Old Testament and you see Jesus everywhere. But in the book of Isaiah. It is an interesting book in so many ways. Not only does it say much about Jesus, but some have noted that it actually breaks down in a very providential way. You realize in the Old Testament we have 39 books in the Old Testament, and in the New Testament we have 27 books. If you read the book of Isaiah and you get this idea in your mind of 39 and 27, you find that at the end of chapter 39 in Isaiah, he's done with judgment, judgment, judgment. And he starts chapter 40 with comfort ye, comfort ye my people. And it becomes a story of grace and hope and redemption and restoration. And so chapter 40 is where he turns the corner, almost like the New Testament does from the book of Malachi to the book of Matthew. It's a pretty cool book. <laughs> of course, the whole Bible is a pretty cool book, but this book in the middle really does thrill the soul once you get your mind around it. The thing about the Old Testament prophets, especially Isaiah and Jeremiah, they're so big, sometimes we're overwhelmed, but when you get your mind around them, they can really thrill the heart. But our study today takes us to chapter 43. And in chapter 43, the Bible says, But now, thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. Now you've got to realize something. Isaiah was a prophet to the northern kingdom. It had split after Solomon went off of the scene from the northern to the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom composed of about ten tribes and the southern kingdom, Judah, uh, kind of envelops and, uh, and, and absorbs Benjamin. So you have those two down in the southern kingdom. So you have the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Isaiah was a prophet to the northern kingdom. He was actually the zero hour prophet to the northern kingdom. He was going to see the Assyrians come and carry them away. And he was also going to be hated by Manasseh. He actually would be cut in half and put in a log and sawn in half. That's how they would kill him. He was a prophet who was bringing the judgment that the Assyrians were going to come and carry them away. However, I said he, he, he saw that, but he did not see that. Uh, carrying away. He was killed before that. Manasseh hated him quite a bit. Actually, it wasn't Manasseh. Maybe it was. I don't know. At this point, I don't want to get into that detail. Forget all of that, all right? But this was one of those prophets who was a zero-hour prophet, just like Jeremiah was a zero-hour prophet down 
uh, to the southern kingdom when uh, the Babylonians came. So for him to say all of the judgment, judgment, judgment up to chapter 39, turn the corner and say, hey, listen, I have called thee by name. You're mine. I have redeemed you in chapter 43. That's a pretty big deal. He has been telling them that all this stuff is going to happen and it's not going to be good for you. But now he's telling them, don't forget, I've placed my, my eye on you and I will never turn my eye, listen, away from you. I want you to get your mind around something. The Old Testament is made up of a nation that represents what we might call a macrocosm, a a big picture view of how God deals with you and me as individuals, as a microcosm. God will never take His eye off of His children. If He could take His eye off of Israel as His people, then He could take His eye off of you as His child. But the Bible says, He that comes to me, I will in no way cast out. He says, you must be born again. He says, I am come that you might have life and it's everlasting life. He that believeth shall have everlasting life. That's forever. It doesn't start and stop and start and stop. God saves to the uttermost. And even in the earmarks of the old uh, of the last day's church, Jesus, in kind of trying to call the last generation off of the ledge as well, He says to them, just know this, because you think you're rich, you think you're increased with goods, you don't know that you're poor, wretched, naked, and blind. He says, remember this, whom I love, I chasten. That means He disciplines. He works with us. He has a relationship with us. The Bible says that the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and that if any man hath not the Spirit of Christ, he's not of His. All of this to say, He is the earnest of our salvation, the Holy Spirit. We have been sealed. Now, I'm glad that's true, because if it was left up to me, I'd have lost it a long time ago. It's real easy to faint in the way. As I said, it's hard to love consistently. And properly, those from the highest heights to the lowest lows, there's so much that can go sideways in that enterprise that is ours. But just as he says to Jacob that he formed him and he 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 redeemed him and 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 he has he called by him by name, he says, You're mine. Now this is after he's already said, You're going out. The Assyrians are taking you, going to take you out. Now you've seen people who are Christian, they've been taken down. And they've stumbled and they've been chastened and they're like broken and they come back to the altar. And you know what's neat? God always runs down the aisle and gets them before they get down the aisle. Just like the prodigal son and the father and all that. That's a picture. He never stops looking for his child to come home. He says, I have called thee by name. He says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you go through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk in through the fire, he says, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall flame kindle upon thee. Do you know how he can say that? He can say that by precedent. Do you know when the people of Israel came out of Egypt? They passed through the waters. (laughs) Do you know when they went into Israel? They, They passed through the Jordan River. The river. Do you know when they get into Babylon from the southern kingdom goes into Babylon, they're going to throw three Hebrews into the fiery furnace and they're not going to be scorched. You see, the word is altogether consistent. He says, don't forget where you came from, from and don't forget whose you are. <laughs> you know, I like knowing that I'm God's child. Because without that, I could not be so bold as to say, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord, say it, forever. <laughs> you know, that's hope, man. That's where I'm going. I'm not going to the servants' quarters. I'm going into the house. Because why? Because He prepares a table before me. He not only takes me as His sheep, He takes me as His, uh, well, as His guest, if you will. He prepares a table, anoints my head with oil, my cup runs over. He prepares me a table, not just a table, but a table in the presence of my enemies. I'll tell you what, we've got it made as far as our hope is concerned. David knew it. Job knew it. I know that my Redeemer lives. He shall stand on the earth in the latter day and I shall see Him with mine own eyes and not those of another. He says, listen, I know. I know 
John said in the first John chapter 5, he says, These things have I written unto you that you might what? Know that you have eternal life. I know I have eternal life. And eternal life doesn't end. And it doesn't begin when I die. It begins when I'm saved. Jesus said, I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And so you see a lot here that, co that co coincides with the Christian on the smaller level. He says in verse 3, For I, the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior, I gave Egypt for thy ransom, and Ethiopia and Seba for thee. Since thou wast precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable. You know what that means? That means you may have blown it, you may have fumbled it, you may have messed up, and the world looks on and says, How could they not accept who God is? How is it that they're complaining in the wilderness? How is, but we all look back and we honor Israel. Why? Because they are a unique people on the face of history. They are a people who were gone from 70 A.D. to 1948. God's brought them back and He's getting ready to do some good stuff. Our what? Hope in desperate times. And He's put them back on the stage. He's got them in the wings. Right now the church is out being on display for all to see. We're not doing as well as we once did. Some are better than others, but the reality is the church is kind of wearing out. You know, they're getting tired. They're kind of folding, you know. Their knees are buckling and their churches are shuttering doors and diminishing in their membership. And even young people in the new generation don't really prioritize the house of God. They're all, you know, self uh, self-aggrandized to the point where they think, well, I really don't need church. I'll tell you what, it's not about what you need as far as your assessment. God says, I will build my church. Now, I want to be in on that. I just do. But we're on the stage. When the rapture happens, we're out of the way and Israel's back front and center. And guess what? They've been back since 70 AD or for, since, uh, from, since 1948. And as a result of that, God is fixing to do some remarkable things. And I like that because if he's going to do remarkable things, he's got to get us out of the way. And there will be a generation that will not taste death. We will be what is known as was nots. We will be was nots. You say, what do you mean? Well, Enoch walked with God and he was not because <laughs> God took him. We're going to be a bunch of was nots, not has beens, was nots. You want to be a was not? The Bible says that we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment and twinkling of an eye. We're going to be caught up together, dead in Christ first, and then we which are alive are... I'm telling you what, this is hope. How do you get past the initial exasperation of the politic, politics of our day? How do you get past the exasperation of the religious, uh, religiosity of our day, which is not really even resembling what it once looked like? Even just 50 years ago, it looked completely different. And here we are in a new day, in a new era. How do you get past it? Because we have hope. The Bible says in verse 4, Since thou wast precious in my sight, thou hast been honorable. I have loved thee, therefore will I give men for thee and people for thy life. Do you know what he just said? In verse 3 and 4, he says, I gave Egypt for thy ransom. I gave Ethiopia and Seba for thee. I have loved thee, therefore I will, I will, will I give men for thee and people for thy life. You have been with us for some time, may recall me making a statement that is a rather uh, startling statement to, to, to absorb. You know, Jesus died for us because He loved us so much. He really did. He didn't have to die. He said, Father, if there's any way, let this cup pass from me. But before that, He told Peter, He says, don't you think I can call my Father right now and He will send 10,000 angels and deliver me? He says, I could catapult this chore that is laid before me. He said, but for this cause came I into the world. He loved you that much. But beyond that, he has given generations of people to the flames of an eternal condemnation because he loved you. He saw down through the corridors of time who would believe and he knew there would be collateral damage because many would say, I will have nothing to do with a God who says he wants me to worship him. I am my own God. I have created, I'm self, you know, aggrandized. I am, I'm one who's a self-made man and I, I tend to worship my creator and I made myself all I've done, all I've achieved. It's me, it's me, I. 
am my own God. This is not uncommon. You know, Pharaoh thought he was a god, right? You remember in Babylon, uh, you had Nebuchadnezzar who was all pumped up about himself. And he saw, he saw a vision and he was like amazed at this vision. And Daniel, yes, he dissected it and made it clear. But he didn't let it, you know, he couldn't get by the fact that he had all this opulence around him. It was the glory of all kingdoms. So he makes an image of gold. says, worship it. This is where the three Hebrews get thrown into the fire furnace. And what you find is you find that he himself says, look at this great country I have made. And when he wanted worship of his image, of his image, he was saying, in essence, he's a god. Caesar wanted you to worship at his altar, saying, Lord Caesar. Hitler was taking down crosses and putting up pictures of himself. And the Antichrist, who is in the wings as we speak, no doubt, will one day demand worship of himself above every kind of god. You think that's not possible. You look at the global movements of our day. You look at the unification of all things. You may not have known this, but in recent days, like a couple of weeks ago, just a few weeks ago, the Pope went to the United Arab Emirates. He went into an arena of like 70,000 people who were all saying, Pope Francis, Pope Francis, Pope Francis, and they were saying it, and they were Muslims saying it. Nothing like that before. They honored him. He did the sacrament of the Mass in their presence, and... He went even so far as to suggest that it would be really wonderful if we all got together, just like there's a United Nations. He said, we need a United Relations, embodying the three biggest branches of religion in the world, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Now that is huge news, but you didn't hear that on the TV typically because they only give you enough to... Slip it by. But this is huge deal. So he says, I've loved you and therefore I have given men for you. God not only gave his son, but he allowed the collateral damage of people who would not submit themselves, who would not listen, confess with their mouths the Lord Jesus. Who would not bow the knee. The Bible says every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But those who say, I will not submit myself to the carpenter, those people will have some splaining to do. He says, listen, I've given men for thee. I've given e Ethiopia and Seba for thee. I've given Egypt for thy ransom. You know, all those little children that died on the night of the Passover in Egypt. I gave them for you. But he gave for you and me all the generations of time. Now, all of the collateral damage. He says, listen, I know there will be some who will believe and they are worth it. <laughs> I tell you, there's a, uh, sometimes you'll hear that and somebody will ask, was she worth it? You know, the guy's going to you know, take a bullet because he's going to you know, help the girl somewhere in some, some dramatic you know, uh, captivity or something. And one will look at the other, is she worth it? Yeah, she's worth it. You know, Jesus saw the bride and he said, she's worth it. And that would be you and me. The Bible says, fear not, I am with thee. Verse 5, I will bring thy seed from the east and gather them from the west. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. He says, for everyone that is called by, even everyone that is called by my name, in verse 7. I tell you what, what we're looking at here is a picture of what Jesus referenced when he said, listen, I have sheep of other fold in John 10. He says, and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. He say, I'm the good shepherd in chapter 10. He says, I've got other sheep than what you're seeing here. I'm going to bring people from all over the ends of the earth. But you know what? That word echoes to you and me because he's taken Israel, put them on the shelf, and he's put us front and center. And the Bible teaches us that we are his sheep in this day and age, and he is our shepherd. But the Bible says in this passage, of course, he's talking in Luke, a, a similar passage, Luke 13, 29 says, uh, And they shall come from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south, and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. He's going to bring all of the captives. Where's he bringing them from, beloved? Where's he bringing them from? He's bringing them from the four quarters of the earth because during the tribulation, things are going to be so bad, people are hiding in caves. 
They're hiding for their own lives because if they cannot because they cannot buy or sell unless they take a mark. And if they take a mark in their hand or their forehead, they will not be uh, able to be saved ever. The Bible says, "Whoever takes that mark." will be tormented with fire and brimstone forever and ever in the presence of the holy angels. They'll have no rest day or night. This is chapter 14 of the book of Revelation. You can look it up. What I'm saying to you is, is that he's going to bring those who are hiding out. Many of them that are hiding out now are Jewish people during the tribulation. Remember that? The lights go on. They realize the Antichrist is indeed a false Messiah. And as a result of that, they head for the hills and... He shoots forth a flood. He's trying to overwhelm them. But he says, listen, I have loved you. I've given men for you. He says, I'm going to call you and bring you from the east, the west, the north, the south. Verse 6, verse 7. Everyone that is called by my name. For I have created uh, him for my glory. I have formed him. Yea, I have loved him. Now understand when you see him talking about uh, Israel, you know, everyone that is called by my name. Not all Israel... Not everybody who's an Israelite is of Israel. And what does that mean? Well, Israel is the person and Israel is the nation. He says not all in Israel nation is of Israel person. Remember, Jacob, bless me, or I won't let you go unless you bless me. You're no longer called Jacob, you're called Israel, right? And Israel was a man who who wrestled with God. (laughs) He says, I need to know, do you wrestle with God ever? Do you ever have just a little sit down and say, Lord, I just don't know what's going on. I really am hurting here, and I don't know how to explain it, and I don't know how to navigate it. You know, that's having a relationship. The Bible says, come boldly to the throne of grace. We're not supposed to stand outside and let the first veil keep us back, and the second veil to the holiest of holies. He says, no, you come boldly, because that veil's been ripped apart. It's been taken out of the way, and now the way is open, a new and a living way. Jesus is the way. Without Jesus, there is no salvation. He says in this passage that they are going to be people that He has called by His name. Uh, Romans chapter 9 and verses 6 through 8, He says, Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Nation, person. Okay, that's Isaiah 9, uh, 6. And verse 7 says, Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise, the person, the man, the Israel man. He says, the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Romans chapter 11, that was 9, chapter 11 says this, And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, uh, There shall come out of Zion a deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Verse 29 says, For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. I am so glad that's true. Do you know what the church is? It's the ecclesia. Ek means out of, like exit. See? Exit. That's how you get out of here. He's called out, okay? Kaleo. Uh, ecclesia. Called out. Call, kaleo means to call. Ek means out. He called us out. The church is called out. The called out ones. He says the gift and calling of God are without repentance. If you've been called out, if you've been called out of the world, if you've been saved, that's what I'm saying. If you become part of the church, if you've been baptized by one spirit into one body, you cannot be lost anymore. God says my gifts, my calling, they're without repentance. I didn't change my mind. I called you. I sealed you. I'm keeping you. The Bible says my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man be able to pluck them out of my hand. He says, For my Father which gave them me is greater than all, neither shall any man be able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Look at that. That's pretty secure. We're in His hand, we're in the Father's hand. I and my Father are one. He says, You can't be plucked out. And the Bible says in in chapter 8 of the book of Romans, it says, Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. I'm telling you what, I'm just thankful that I'm secure because if any of it depended on me, I, I say again, I would not be able to be standing before you today. 
He has worked with me when I had stumbled and fallen, even as they in Israel have done the same. He's putting them back up on the, on the, uh, on the stage, as it were, in short order here very soon. Verse 7, everyone that is called by my name, he says, I'm going to call them all to me. After the tribulation has run its course, all of them are going to be saved in a day. He says, for I have created Israel for my glory. This is all verse 7. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. Bring forth the blind of the people, ye that, uh, that have eyes and the deaf that have ears. Let all the nations be gathered. You remember that, right? He's going to gather all the nations together as a, as a shepherd gathers the sheep and the goats. And on his left side, he's going to put the goats. And he's going to say, depart into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Never prepared for man. Prepared for the... But you're going there if you don't know him. He says, and put the sheep on your right hand. And he says, you're going to enter into the kingdom. That's physical, literal kingdom. He's got it prepared for that generation that will have lived through the tribulation. Human people going into a literal kingdom, having come through the flames of the tribulation. He says, let all the nations be gathered in verse 9. And when I say that, you understand Matthew 25 uh, it talks about it. He says, and before Jesus shall be gathered all nations. And he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divided the sheep from the goats. Chapter 25, verse 30 of Matthew, uh, verse 33, it says, And he shall set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. All that is what Jesus said would happen. Here he's saying, gather all the nations to me. And he says, who among them can declare this? Who among them, who, who among the nations can declare this? And show us former things. And what he's doing is he's making a strong distinction between Israel and every other nation. You know, if you take the Book of Mormon, you will not find any archaeological evidence for anything they say. The same can be said for the Book of, uh, of Islam, the Quran, because they do not have an archaeological history other than that which is pirated from the Bible. In fact, those books are written by one, not by many. The book of the Bible is written by over 40 authors over 1,500 years. We've got an amazing, amazing book that does not contradict, but is always confirmed. Those who look will find. That's where our faith is rooted. It's rooted in a strong foundation. He says, bring all those nations. Who among them, verse 9, can declare this and show us former things? Let them bring forth their witnesses that they may be justified. Or let them hear... And say, it is truth. He says, let them hear what Israel has to say. Israel can tell us about the very earliest days in Ur of the Chaldeans, that city where Abraham was called out. It can tell us about Abraham and Sarah. And it can tell us about Isaac being born when it was impossible for Sarah to have any kids. It can tell us and tell us and tell us and tell us. And the story unfolds and it's even unfolding today. They can tell us about the Six-Day War in the 70s. Isn't that crazier in the 60s, I guess that was. You're talking about an amazing thing here. In the 70s, there was a, another battle where they gained Jerusalem back. It's a crazy town out there because God is there and He is not silent. He's bringing them back. He's getting them set up. He's giving them Jerusalem for crying out loud. They didn't go after it on their own, but it became theirs because they were pushed to go for that which was... Uh, was defensive in all ways and then end up with more and more. Let all the nations be gathered. And he says in verse 10, let the, at the end of verse 9, he says, let them hear and say it is truth. He says, you are my witnesses, saith the Lord. Get that? <laughs> when the Israelites, uh, when, when the, when the um, rapture occurs and the church is taken out of the way, the Bible says the Holy Spirit and the salt and the light that we represent is taken out of the way and no hindrance now to evil. And it's going to be a very irreligious time. You're going to have chaos, you're going to have anarchy, you're going to have death and famine and war. It's going to be a really bad time. Those are the seal judgments only. You get to the trumpets, it gets worse. You get to the vile judgments, forget about it. And so what you're having here is he's saying, listen, you are my witnesses and he's going to get a witness from them. Think about it. Seven year tribulation, they're going to get a witness. They're going to get a witness. And they're, and they're going to be the ones that are witnessing. The 144,000 Jewish evangelists are going to preach and Israel's going to be converted in a day. And there's going to be two witnesses standing uh, there preaching for three and a half years till they die and then they're resurrected. It's crazy what we have to live. This is real-time stuff. What do you do to overcome these desperate times? What, where's your hope? I'm telling you, you got a lot of it. We know what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be loving. Well, I don't want to love. I'm angry. I'm frustrated. Life's hard. People are crazy, man. I don't want to do that. But wait a minute. Jesus is coming. I need to have a little compassion. Oh, okay. I get it. I get it. I need to rein me in. 
And I need to work with God who's trying to work in me to confirm for me to the image of Jesus. Do you understand how huge the hope is? Because again, I quote to you 1 John chapter 3, Beloved, it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when we shall see Him, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And every man that has this hope in Him, this hope in Him, purifies Himself even as He is pure, and He tells us that we are supposed to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling, knowing this, that it is God that is at work within us. Isn't that good to know? You're not working it out on your own. God's in there saying, you know you need to be nice to that person. <laughs> you know you need to forgive that person. You can say, yeah, I know. <laughs> you know, it's funny to read the scriptures and it says, you know, that we're supposed to pray, Our Father, heaven, hallowed by thy name, thy kingdom. And it ends with, forgive us our debts, you know, and all that, as we forgive those who trespass. He says, you know, if you don't, trust, if you don't forgive you them who trespass, you, you won't be forgiven. You say, does that mean I'm lost? No, that means you're going to walk around in a state of, uh, of what we might call unfellowship, out of fellowship with God. Now, just like you have a person, it could be your brother, your sister, your mom, your dad, your cousin, whatever. You're still related to them, but you're not in fellowship. You don't even want to be in a room. Some people are like, man, I don't even want to be. What? Love forgives. You know, Jesus absorbed the consequences of our sin, didn't he? Isn't that what he did on the cross? Isn't that what godliness looks like? God absorbed the consequences of our sin. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon Him, and with His stripes we are healed. He says, you are my witnesses. And He's talking in those days to Israel, because that's talking about the time when He's bringing them back. But notice, now you are my witnesses. You shall be witnesses unto me, right? That's what it says, Acts chapter 1. In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the world, go ye into all the world, preach the gospel, teaching, baptizing, teach, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things. He's telling us that we are witnesses now, but when we're catapulted out of here, they're going to be His witnesses. And guess what? When they give their witness, they're going to be so strong in their witness that it's going to carry them all the way through the Millennial Kingdom. And it's going to make everybody forget that they whined and moaned and complained and kicked and spit and grumbled all in the Old Testament. And he talks about that here. You are my servants, he says the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. You might underline those words. I am he. Before me there is no God formed, neither shall there be any after me. I, even I, the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. So he said, he's saying to them, I am He. I am the Lord. He's saying, I am your Savior. And in verse 12, he says, you are my witnesses again. Now, why is that a significant thing to say, I am He? Well, because Jesus said in John chapter 8, He said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Verse 24 says, I say therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am He, you shall die in your sins. And the word He is, is, uh, is added. It's in italics, meaning it's added. He says, I am. I am. That's what the name, covenantal name of God is. Who shall we, Moses said, who shall I say sent me? He says, tell them I am who I am sent me. Sent you. He's saying, if you don't believe that I am, Jesus said, if you don't say that, if you don't believe that I am, you'll die in your sins. Jesus is God in human form. The Bible says it pleased the Father that in Christ the fullness of the Godhead should dwell. We see him as the one who's the creator. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Down in chapter or verse uh, 12, I believe it is. Uh, he tells us the Word became flesh and dwelt among us down into the chapter. But back up again to chapter 1 of John's Gospel. He says, all things were made by the, the Word, and without Him was nothing made that was made. Who is He? Well, He's the same one in, John, in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the He's God. He's not to be trifled with. He's not to be dismissed. He's to be honored. He's to be worshipped. He's to be received. He is the Savior as He always has been. 
He says, I, beside me there is no Savior, verse 11. Verse 12 says, I have declared and have saved and I have showed and there was no strange God among you. Therefore, you are my witnesses. What did he show? He showed manna for 40 years. He showed the Shekinah glory in the cloud and the fire. Remember the fire by night and the cloud by day? The cloud in the wilderness and in the, in the, in the desert is a good thing to have, right? Ever been out there on a hot day? Got a cloud. Yeah, it's like God, it's like a mama over that baby, you know, on a day when they're pushing them in the little carriage, you put the hand over their face. <laughs> you know, Jesus followed them around for 40 years, putting his hand over their eyes so they wouldn't be all too hot. He's trying to keep them comfortable. Good thing. He does that for you and me, by the way. Little ways, every day. He gives his angels charge over us, lest we dash our foot against the stone. You and I have now been put front and center as his bride. But again, go back. He says, I have declared and have saved, verse 12. You are my witnesses. So he says, you're my witnesses. He says, I'm your redeemer, in verse 14. For your sakes I have sent to Babylon. Wait a minute. This is Isaiah. I have sent to Babylon. That's passing the Assyrians who are going to take away the northern kingdom. He's looking down past that to where Judah is going to be left. The north southern kingdom is going to be left around. They're going to be carried away by Babylon. He says, for your sake I have sent to Babylon. For your sake? How hard is it to be thrown into Babylonian captivity? I was reading through the Psalms this week and I realized that there's much to be said about their, their, their excursion into Babylon. And, and one of the things that they had to contend with was they were being told, you sing songs of Zion for us. Come on, come on, sing something. You know, you're, you're from Jerusalem, you sing something. And they're like, how can we sing in a foreign land? But you know what did happen, right? Ezekiel was there, Daniel was there, his brothers in, 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 in arms, if you will, was there. And as a result, they gave witness, didn't they? What kind of witness? Well, Daniel gave a pretty big witness. He gave us one that's down to the wire. I mean, down to the very day that Jesus the Messiah would come, 500 years before he came or so. It's 490 years, so almost 500 years. That yeah, was be five, about 500 years. 490, 483 years to the day Jesus marched into Jerusalem on a donkey. That day was predicted well before it ever occurred. We're going to come back to that in a minute. He says in verse 15, I'm your Lord, the Holy, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Behold Jerusalem, behold O Israel. He says, your King comes meek and lowly, uh, riding on the fowl of an ass, right? You have Him as the King. He presented Himself as King on Palm Sunday later to be crucified, just as Daniel told. All of the prophecies, all of Ezekiel's words, all of the things about a millennial kingdom are there. He says, He maketh a, a way in the sea, verse 16, verse 17. He says, Which bringeth forth the chariot and horse, and they are now extinct. He's talking about getting delivered out of Egypt. <laughs> he brings all... What, did, what in the world was the Pharaoh thinking? Go after him, for goodness sake. <laughs> no, wait a minute. You crazy people, they're with God. We just are kind of hanging out here. And when they entered and the last Israelite exited, they were wiped out and made extinct. That's a pretty big vignette on the canvas of history. And if you go now underneath... The waters are over in the Red Sea. You find chariot wheels that are petrified. Crazy. Evidence everywhere. The Bible says, Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. He's not asking a question. He's telling them, Don't remember your fumbles. Don't remember your foibles. Did you know the Bible says that His mercies are new every morning? Isn't that good to know? He's telling Israel, Don't be remembering the things of old. He says, I'm going to do a new thing. Isn't that neat? I'm going to do a new thing. He says, I will even make a way in the wilderness. In verse 19. Why do they need a way in the wilderness? Well, if you read the book of Revelation, there's not going to be any water for a long time. You know, all the springs, all the water is going to be fouled. Wormwood's going to come and take what little's left after half of the tribulation has gone through and into those bold judgments. And they're going to be scorched. And we find in chapter 7 of the book of Revelation at the very end, it says even those who come out of great tribulation, they will be no more thirsty, no more scorched. The heat of the sun will no, no more light upon them. He said, I'm going to do a new thing. 
And he's going to take seven years to get Israel uh, back righted with him. And he says, you don't even have to look at the old things anymore. Because I'm doing a new thing. And by the time I'm done with you, you're going to be honorable indeed. They're like the family that wanted to be, you know, on the throne. It's like everybody wanted to be on the throne with Jesus. But there's only one person who's going to sit by Jesus and his throne. And that's the church. That's his bride. Just like the king and the queen. You know, we get to sit with him. But Israel's just the... Like John was the friend of the bridegroom. That's the best man. He says, I rejoice. I've seen the bridegroom. I'm good. And uh, when he died, he was the last vestiges of the Old Testament prophets. But now, now Jesus has a bride. He's waiting to come for. And that's what he will do. I'll do a new thing. I'm going to make a way in the wilderness. The beast shall honor me. All these things are going to honor me. He says, I'm going to give drink to my people in verse 20. They're thirsty. (laughs) You know, if you're super thirsty and there is no water... You would appreciate this. We just have a faucet. We turn it on. We're good all the time. But I'm telling you, this is huge, isn't it? You know. Verse 21 says, This people have I formed for myself. They shall show forth my praise. That's what the millennial kingdom's all about. The tribulation is getting Israel back in the game. And that's why being back in the land in 1948 to present day is huge. Because they're back. God's getting ready to put them back in the game. And when he goes through the tribulation, they will finally, in Zechariah chapters 12, 13, and 14, they will see him whom they pierced. And they will mourn for him as for an only son. They will ask him, what are these wounds in your hands? He says, they are the wounds which my brethren inflicted upon me, which I received in the house of my friends. And that is going to be all put in the rear view. Don't remember those things. He says, I'm going to do a new thing. Verse 22, but thou hast called upon me, uh, hast not called upon me. Thou hast been weary of me, neither hast thou honored me with sacrifices. He's saying, I get it. I get it. He says, not only that, verse 24 says, but you have made me to serve with your sins. That is a huge word. You might underline it because that is what's happening in the church as it winds down. We've gotten to the place where grace is so uh, exploited that people are making God to serve with their sin. That's not a good thing. That's why the Laodicean church age uh, period is a very scary place to live because if you're looking at somebody to the right and to the left of you, you may look pretty good compared to that, but you still may be asking God to serve with your sin because the church is a mess, right? You know? Uh, It's sort of like the girl who would perhaps have a wedding and she's outside and it was all planned and the wind came up and her hair blew and her eyes got wet because rain came and all her mascara and her dress. Yeah, yeah, that's us, man. We're getting beat up down here. And for you and me as individuals, we need to make sure our wedding garments are kept in order. That's up to us. But he made, he was made to serve with their sins. That means God, even in Israel or even in Babylon, even in their dispersion, they were made to serve. Uh, They were making God to serve with his sins. You have wearied me with your iniquities. And that's that's one very profound word right there, isn't it? But look what he says in the next verse. I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgression for my sake, my own sake. Do you know when the Israelites would pray, Dear God, please have mercy for David, thy servant's sake. Does that put it into a little bit of perspective that when we say, In Jesus' name, we don't deserve to have our sins forgiven, but in Jesus' name, please. Oh, now I got it. (laughs) Now I get it. He forgives me in Jesus' name, for Jesus' sake. Not because I deserve it, but because Jesus, oh, he delivered salvation full and free. It's a complete work. That's why when he said it is finished, he was saying it is paid in full to tell us thy. He says, thou hast made me to serve with thy sins. He says, but I blotted out your transgression for mine own sake and will not remember thy sins. Put me in remembrance. Let us plead together and declare thou that thou mayest be justified. And you know what that's saying? It's plead means we're going to have a courtroom drama here. You know, you bring your facts, I'll bring mine. And he says, you put me in remembrance. And now, now you can finally be justified. You will not be justified in your own efforts, in your own works, in your own, you know, devices, or in your own designs. 
He says, put me in remembrance. Let us plead together. Let's, let's go to court about this. He says, put me in remembrance. Declare thou that thou mayest be justified. That's what the 144,000 are going to do. They're going to say, Jesus was the Messiah. That's what all the saved Jews are going to do in Israel. That's what the two witnesses are going to do in Israel as they preach for three and a half years. And they're going to preach that Jesus is why they're saved. Not because of themselves, because they already know that ship has sailed. Couldn't have been that. <laughs> and any of us who are honest know it couldn't have been that for us either. He says, put me in remembrance. You might underline those words to remind you what that verse is all about. Verse 27 says, the first father hath, thy first father hath sinned, and thy teachers have transgressed against me. What he's saying is he's saying, I know, I get it. I get it. You know what the first father's probably referencing the Moabites and the Canaanites and all of them. They were the ones that they mimicked. He said, don't be like those nations. And they kind of, and, and there's a verse that talks about they were their father in one sense. We could go all the way back to Adam. We could say, you know, like, Paul, like David said in Psalm 51, he says, behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. I've got a sin nature. I'm a mess. But he's saying, I get all that. I understand that. That's why I'm standing by you. Isn't that crazy? It's like, okay, I get it. You ever met somebody you were really wondering why they're so mean all the time and then finally you heard their story and you realize, man, they've been bumped, hit, beaten, battered, rejected, hated, and all they're doing is hitting back before anybody gets close to them. And pretty soon you're like, man, I feel really bad about that. I really need to do something for Joe or, or Jill or whatever. I need to help. And that's what God does with you and me. He knows what you're like. He knows why you're why, the way you are. Verse 28 says, Therefore I have profaned the princes of the sanctuary and have given Jacob to the curse of the, and Israel to reproaches. Now understand what he's saying in essence is he's saying, Yeah, I know. I know. You've been in battle. You've been in uh, judgment. You've been under judgment. You've been under a curse. It's been tough. But you know what? 1900 years later, you still are a people. <laughs> Who can say that? 70 A.D. to 1948, okay, just a little under 1,900 years, these people still are a people. Not only are they still a people, but now they're back to a land that was all but a desert when they showed up, and now it's springing forth. He, God, is amazing. Verse 1 says in the next chapter, Yet now hear, O Jacob. He says, Fear not, O Jacob, in verse 2. He says, O uh, my servant, and thou Jeshurun, Jeshurun, Je, Jeshurun means upright one. Upright one. He's calling him upright. You know, when God saved me, he called me son. Do you know what he did? He went beyond that. He said, saint. He said, child of God. He says, join heir with Christ. He says things to me that I just say, well, wait a minute, that can't be me. Are you? Linda said she went into this place recently and the lady knew, knew my daughter and she knew Aunt Linda from having met her once and, or something like that. And she said, she says, hey, it's so good to see you. Linda's like, what? Who? What? You know, because she didn't know the lady that well. But because my daughter had made a good impression and my wife was also connected to her in that woman's mind, she was treating her like an old friend. You know what God does? He treats you like his child. Come on in and sit on my lap. <laughs> because you're mine, and my mark is upon you. He says, come, he says, hear now, he says, fear not, uh, because you're a Jeshurun who I have chosen. Verse 3 says, for I will pour water upon him that is thirsty. I love that. If you're thirsty, you've seen it, right? Somebody's taking a drink pretty soon, they take a whole bucket and just pour it on. This is going to be a really hot time during the tribulation. The Bible says the sun is going to scorch men on earth. They're going to cry out for that plague. And he says, my spirit, he says, I'm going to pour out water upon him that is thirsty, the flood and floods upon the dry ground, and I will pour my spirit upon thy seed and my blessing upon thine offspring. This is a great hope. Verse 5 says, one shall say, I am the Lord's, and another is going to surname himself by the name of Israel. This is sort of like getting a check mark on your, on your, uh, on your, on your sneakers, you know, or you know, getting a, a land's end insignia here. They're going to be all about it. Okay, they're going to be all about God. That's what he's saying. And he says this, he says in verse 6, he says, I am the first and the last. Beside me there is no God. Revelation chapter 1 verse 8 says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, which was, which is, and which is to come. I'm the beginning and the ending. He says in chapter 1 verse 11, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. He says in chapter 1, verse 17, Fear not, I am the first and the last. 
Did you hear that? First and the last. Jesus saying, I'm the first and the last. By the way, verse 8 says, I am the Almighty of Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. He says in verse 17, I'm the first and the last. Revelation 2, verse 8, I'm the first and the last. Revelation 22, verse 13, I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Here we have it said that God says, I am the first and the last. Beside me there is no God. Who is Jesus? He is God. We need to worship Him. He is called, His name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. He was never called that by a you know, proper name. It was what people understood Him to be. Thomas, the doubting Thomas, falls on his knees after saying, I wouldn't believe Him unless I put my hand in His side. He says, but be believing, Thomas. He says, put your hand in my side. He falls to his knees and says, my Lord and my God. We need to understand the hope we have is not just sort of a hope so. It is a no so. It is an anticipation. And it will get you past the nonsense of these desperate times. Verse 8 says, Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have I not told thee from that time and have declared it? He says, uh, he says I've told you all along. He says in verse 7, I skip this, he says, and who, uh, and who as I shall call and shall declare it and set it in order for me since I appointed the ancient people. Who has done it like I have done and the things that are coming and shall come? Let them show, uh, let them show unto them. He says, listen, there's no other God that did this. I told you what was coming and I did it. This, by the way, makes sense of Romans. You might put it in your margin for looking at later. Romans chapter 9 and verses 10 and 11 where the Bible says, it's not to him that works, but of him that calleth. When he says calleth, he's not talking about calling people by out. He's saying he called it. Just like he says here, he says, and who as I shall call and shall declare. He's saying I call it and it happens. Okay, flip a coin, call it. He calls it. He called it. It's not him that works, but of him that calls. God is the one who calls. That's uh, a connective to Re Romans chapter 9. Verse 8 says, Ye even are my witnesses. That's what's happening in the millennial kingdom. There is witnesses. Verse 9 says, They make graven images, and there's a whole discussion about graven images. It ends at the verse 20 where he says, He feedeth on ashes. He that makes graven images feeds on ashes. Why does he say that? Because he says after a while, those are graven images, they're made of wood, they wear out, and they get chinked, and they get messed up, and finally they chop them down, put them on the wood, and they make their roast. <laughs> he says, you know, they're feeding on ashes. I am God, and you are my witnesses, he tells Israel. And all the while that Israel's being his witnesses, guess what we are? We're ruling and reigning with Jesus. No big deal. <laughs> really? It is a big deal. We are a royal priesthood, a peculiar people, you know, that we should show forth the praises of Him because we're His witnesses of Him that called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. He says in verse 21, Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for thou art my servant. I have formed thee. Thou art my servant. Verse 22, I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions and thy sins. He says, I have redeemed thee. You see what he's doing? He's sowing hope to a people who are going into a dark tunnel called Babylonian captivity, Assyrian captivity, dispersion, judgment, and annihilation, it would seem, at, at uh, 70 AD. But not. They might have looked down. They might have looked slaughtered. But they were not done. On the day of Pentecost, there were, there were Israelites coming from all sectors and nations to Pentecost when the Holy Spirit fell in, Rebel, in, in Acts chapter 2. He says in verse 25, he says, I am the God, in verse 24, that maketh all things, that frustrateth, verse 25, the tokens of liars, that confirmeth the word of his servants. That means prophets prophesied and I confirm it. And he says in verse uh, 28, that saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure. This is written uh, like a hundred years before Cyrus is ever born. And Cyrus is so taken by the fact that his name is written down that in Ezra chapter 1 he says, seeing that the God of all the heavens has seen fit to call me and tell me to send the people of God back to their homeland and let them build a temple in their city, he says, let it be so. And over and over again he quotes in Ezra 1 and Daniel 9 talks about when the going forth is given for the uh, going forth of a commandment to rebuild the temple. He says from that day to, to 483 years, 
is going to be when the Messiah will come. And that is right here, first of all, foreshadowed 100 years earlier, uh, a little better than 100 years because this is a serious time, and all the way up to uh, when they get out of Babylonian captivity 70 years later. We're talking about some amazing things. Where he calls Cyrus by name, and this is not the only place he does it. He calls him his shepherd, and he says, he says I am the Lord that saith of Cyrus... He is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built. (laughs) The city. All I want you to know here as I conclude (laughs) is this hope we have. It's got grit. It's got teeth. It's got sinew. It's, It's got all the flesh you could have. We can feed on this. And when you go out in your day to day and you see your country, which you love many times, be looking like something you don't even recognize. When you go out there and you try to witness to somebody who has such a darkness in their heart, they would rather argue with you than even talk about God. Because the darkness is kind of covering the land. Every now and then you'll find those people who are really willing and open and they're exciting to find. It's a good day. But it's getting fewer and further between, isn't it? We're finding that our country is going dark. But I want you to know, Jesus is the light of the world. Amen. And he who will come shall come, and he will not tarry. And we have great hope for these desperate times. And if you don't know Jesus, you need to. Because he said, I'm the way, and no man comes to the Father but by me. There's a lot of people who think it's the way of works, it's the way of baptism, it's the way of you know, behaving a certain way or keeping a certain creed. It has nothing to do with that. The Bible says, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and as much as to call Him God, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. The Bible says God loved the world so much He gave His only begotten Son that whoever would believe in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. He says that God didn't send His Son into the world to condemn the world. The next verse says this, John 3, 17. God didn't send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. I hope you have great hope today. In this church, I think you hear it enough to know, hey, this hope is real. You know, those dry bones that Ezekiel was shown was, it was Israel. They looked like they were gone. Can these bones live? He says, you know, Lord. He says, speak to the wind. And as he spoke to the wind, it brought fire back rattling among the bones, sinew among the bones, flesh among the bones, and they raised up a mighty army. To this very day, Israel is a blessed country in a biblical sense. You realize, perhaps, that they've just recently said they may very well have had a, found a, a cure for cancer. Did you know this? Pretty amazing stuff. They also have some... They're, they're, the, they're, they're the ones who gave you your cell phone. They're the ones. That was them. That was their technology. They're the ones who, who have a, 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 what we would call Star Wars here. They do it off the ground. They shoot missiles out of the ground as they come. 1,500 missiles a year or something like that shot at them. They knock them all down that, that are in any, in any way going to be dangerous. Many of those that are shot by the enemy of Israel uh, go into the desert because they don't know what they're doing. They're just throwing rocks and seeing if they can't hit something. <laughs> That's how primitive they are. Israel's over there. Oh, that one's going to hit a city. Let's knock it down. I want you to know, guys, you're living in biblical times right now. The movie's about ready to run the credits. And I'm excited. Aren't you? Would you bow with me for a moment? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed.